everyone. Welcome to the third edition of I Want to Be the President of Nigeria. I'm your host, Ifama Chibogo. Thank you for the likes, the shares, and the wonderful comments for part two. Thank you. Today on Ifama Speaks, there are three 2019 presidential aspirants. Eunice Atuejide, Adamu Gariba, and Dr. Adeshino Fabuero Byron, SFB for short. You will have a wonderful time listening to them. Stay tuned. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to Ifama Speaks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could you please tell us some more about yourself? Yes, my name is Adam Ugarba. I was born 36 years ago. I became 36 years last June uh, to a family of an Islamic scholar. Uh, my father's name is uh, Adam Ugarba too. You know that, that's his name. And my mother's name is Khadija Garba. And I started life as an Almajiri boy. You know, typical Almajiri lifestyle of northern what Nigeria. What Almajiri mean? Yeah, Almajiri means uh, the the um, some people, or I can say the traveler, somebody who moves one way from one place to the other in search of knowledge. So you know, traditionally in the northern society, when you grow up in the house where Islamic scholarship is actually what they anchor, you you see them pushing some of their male children to go and and start the tradition. So I started that tradition when I was four years. And by the age of eight, I got into conventional school after circumcision because we usually are circumcised, you know, around that period of time. Then from there, I started my public primary school in Lugere, in Jimeta, uh, that's Adamawa State, where I was born. And then also proceeded to secondary school in the same uh, local government, Jimeta, or Yola, not local government. From there, I went to university in, in university uh, at, at Kano. We call it a uh, Kano University of Science and Technology within. And, uh, I had been an activist when I was young and went uh, somewhere around 2001 when I started anchoring an association to how to see we can uh, the youths of my area coming together to see how we can better the society. So we called the association Jimeta Youth Progressive Association of which I was youngest president at the age of 19 then. Then from there I carried the vision down into the university. So I now conceived something called Vision 2019 uh, uh, in 2004 then the university felt like this is a problem. How can a young boy at the age of 22 talking about Vision 2019 right now here? This could be mad. So, and it was so uniting. It was, the, the thing just caught fire. Many people associated with the vision because it's talking about the unity, the centrality, and the greatness of Nigeria's future. So everybody likes it. And, and of course, then um, we have a lot of challenges in the university. Uh, and they decided to say this guy needs to leave this school because it's a threat when the new VC came in and then he sent me away. So on, on moving out, I decided to change my career course to technology field, enrolled into technology classes and learned something around Microsoft technology. From there I came to Lagos, got some jobs in one and two and three places, you know, for two years, then resigned and then used that same Microsoft knowledge I have to set up a business that is now 10 years old. Thank you. Thank you very At much. 36, you're young. Is that an advantage or a disadvantage? A very big advantage. It means you have the right energy. It means you have the right capacity. It means you have demonstrated, especially if you look at my lifestyle, it's a lifestyle of almost impossibility in Nigeria, say to possibility. And one thing that I didn't even mention is I've never stepped out of Nigerian borders throughout the history of IPI. That's like the fact that I can be able to do so. I usually send my deputy to go and collect the awards. I want to be a hundred percent whole Nigerian to give inspiration to the Nigerian youth that is actually very possible in this country. So to me, it's a very, very huge advantage, especially with the preparation I have in trying to lead this country since that 2004. In 2007, I started deliberate effort to see how we can do to fix Nigeria. How did other countries do to succeed? What have they done right? Why are we not doing right? How can we get it right? I studied 144 different countries' statecraft. And then on, from there, I was able to extract what we need to really do to shape Nigeria and put it on the path to greatness. So I believe it's a very good advantage. Especially if you look at our current political establishment, none of them have um, uh, uh, a history of starting something from zero and then converting it to one. All my life has been a start from zero to one. I made my family almost at ground zero. We are now well to do. 
you know, because of my heavy effort, I made my company I started it from ground zero. We are now also doing well. So that means I have instead of starting from zero to one. So I think uh, it's a very good advantage. <laughs> You're vibrant and innovative. One would expect that you would have been uh, contesting for presidency on a new platform. Mm. Why the old? Yes, the problem is when we want to succeed as a country, we need a leader that is talking about us. Not a leader that is talking about we or them. And that us means the younger generation of Nigerians, the Nigerian that is born today or conceived today, and the Nigerian that is dying right now. All these people are Nigerians. And for you to do that, you need to identify with everything Nigeria, bad or good, because it constitutes what is to be a Nigerian. And identifying with a platform like APC, to me, is identifying with Nigerian history. Because from independence, since prior to independence in 1957, the political parties that came together, the NC, NC, the AG, and the NPC, were the same parties that metamorphosed in the Second Republic, and then we now have the election of 1978-79. The same parties metamorphosed in the Third Republic, we have SDP and NRC. The same parties now came back to be ANPP and PDP, and now we have APC and PDP. So it's part of Nigerian history. I don't want to throw away anything negative or positive because I need it for the future generation to learn from it. So the best solution is to identify with the platform that is talking about the history of Nigerian state. And that is why I come inside the APC one. The second thing again is we are not contesting against our elders. I am a very responsibly brought up young man. I cannot install and castigate my elders. I believe they have done their best. What they have done so far, to the best of my knowledge, is the best they think they can offer. And when I sit with them and discuss with them, I find patriotism in most of them, contrary to what general people believe. But the problem is, their understanding in how to make a nation clearly contradicts the 21st century model. And that is why we are getting a disconnect. So we are there to try to let them go and retire and relax so that we can continue the legacies that they have founded. One. The second thing again is we want to show clear example that Nigerian youths are not as bad as the elders think. They are not as irresponsible as the elders think. They are not as lazy as the elders think. They can actually identify with them, honorably and respectfully disagree with them and bring new things on table that is going to make Nigeria to be one of the greatest nations in the world. So when it's time for them to leave they are living in peace and they will bequeath the nation strong for the next generation of Nigerians that are ready to make it even better that they've found it. What have you contributed to Nigeria from the time you were born till now? Yes, I, I, am, uh, I am born in Nigeria. My parents were born Nigerian. My grandparents were born Nigerians. And as I was telling you earlier, um, I met my parents almost uh, ground zero, a typical humble family of the north. And now they are doing very well from ground zero. You know, my father is very proud of giving birth to a child like me. So I'm sure this is a very strong contribution because he never thought he could be where he is just with the birth of a child. And my mom, up to the time of her dying bed, her, my mom could not go out of her mouth. She was rolling out blessings. So uh, that is a contribution. And I told you again that I started my business from ground zero. And now he's employing about 46 people, you know, young people within the economy. I believe this is a very interesting contribution to the country, especially with about 200 customers that we service and they've seen efficiency in the way we deliver the services. This to me is a very strong contribution. And I have lived this life responsibly, following law and order in all ways, paying my dues, paying my tax, doing the right thing, not going to shortcuts, not jumping to get government contracts, we're trying to follow private sector to chase the small, small job that people are running away from. Despite the fact that I am coming from the north, many people are expecting me to be in Abuja, chasing the government contract with briefcase. I stay in Lagos. I have only history of doing one government contract since I started this company till today. So I think... Uh, I think uh, this is pretty much a very good contribution. And there are other contributions, um, like normal support for people going to school and this and that. I don't usually like to mention them publicly because I it feel like it is against my personal principle. It feel like I'm going to use their sympathy to get elevation. So uh, I would like to respect them with that and, and keep it that way. But this is a little of what I have contributed to the making of this great country. And now, I also prepared myself from 2007 till now, 12 years, in readiness to make Nigeria to be one of the greatest nations in the world by the year 2035, the manifestos are there on adamugarba.org. Clear, tractable process that you can use 
to make Nigeria to transit away from poverty completely. 180 million Nigerians to live above $10 a day and also to be one of the greatest nations in the world. Our plan is by 2045, when the new world order is being enacted, I want Nigeria to be one of the peace. Now we have P5, so the P end that is coming, I want Nigeria to be part of them. We can't do that until we come together and build a country that becomes one of the greatest nations. And this is actually one of my next tasks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So when you become president, yes. what are we to expect? Yeah, what you should expect is simple. After the independence of this country, I came to study a lot of things around the way the country governance system has been running. And we there's a clear disconnect as to why is Nigeria a Nigeria and how Nigeria has been administered. When you have a disconnect between the why and the how, there is always going to be a confusion in the system. Nigeria has been a marketplace from the beginning. It's not a country defined by natural border. This is a place that have diverse and various kingdoms living together, even before the advent of colonialism. So it's a federation that is amount as a marketplace. When the British were going out, uh, even when they came in, in the first place, the place was a resource-rich area. You have about 12 million or 12.7 million slaves that are exported around the Bight of Biafra and Bight of Benin. And after even the slave trade uh, 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 gets get disbanded uh, by, by British in 1807, it has a lot of resources. We have human resources, we have material resources, and we are located in one of the strategic uh, areas of the world. We are members of Atlantic Alliance. We have 853 miles of shoreline. We have about 2,500 miles of River Niger coming directly from Guinea Mountains into the hinterlands from the Delta to Atlantic Ocean. We also have uh, River Beno coming from Lake Doha and Lake Chad joining confluence in Kogi, you know, down to the Atlantic Ocean. This is the area good for business. You have material resources, you have human resources, and you have the river system. You know, the river system transportation on river is usually cheaper, at times cheaper than transportation on land. So it makes it easy for British to explore this area. When they left, you know, because then the area was owned by this man, Sir George Goldie. You know, he had a company, a Royal Niger company, and we have UAC and Unilever then that controls almost 85% of Nigerian trade. When they pulled out and they started industrializing, they handed over a vibrant marketplace to our leaders. But unfortunately, they are very, very patriotic leaders. They understood and they want Nigeria to be a great nation. But they, they focus more on the political side of the handing over as opposed to the economic side. Meanwhile, Nigeria itself is meant to be an economic entity, not a political entity. So that is why our plan for the country is to transfer it back to this economic entity, to make sure that Nigeria is a marketplace, is defined its entire processes, policy, and procedure to conform to the principle of market economy. That is why we even plan, as a part of our proposal, to transform the six geopolitical zone to nine geoeconomic zones. So we now remove these so-called geopolitical zones because we are not a politically divided country. We are an economically integrated unit. So these are the things we are looking at. So my job, if I become the president, is to provide this enabling platform whereby Nigerians can build a country of greatness that is going to be a liberation to the entire black race and that can transport the culture of peace and prosperity to the whole humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have anything else to say to Nigerians. Yes, what I have to say to Nigerians is that this, the responsibility of building in Nigeria is, uh, is our responsibility. All of us don't agree to any blame game. It's over. The damages are there. The confusion are there. People are dying every day. Um, we have, uh, I saw personally, uh, sometimes back when I was young, a, a woman losing her child because she can't afford 100 naira treatment for malaria for the child. And there are millions of them still facing this kind of problem. So it is our responsibility. You don't sit down and say you are pointing blame to Buhari or to Jonathan or to Ubasanjo to fix the country. It's not possible. It is our responsibility. So if we don't rise up this time around and come together and do the right thing, I'm telling you we are also going to share in the blame for all the confusion that is happening in Nigeria today. So let's all rise up this 2019 elect the right president that has the right program for the benefit and the future of generations and generations of Nigerians to come. I am telling you that I represent that persona. If you give me your trust, you will never regret at all voting for me for once as the Nigerian president. Thank you very much. We have been listening to 36-year-old Adamu Garba, a presidential aspirant, and his catchphrase is forward for progress. 
I wish him all the best. Thank you so much for coming on Informa Speaks. Thank you very much. I Thank really you, Adam. Now go this, so see. Good to see you, Dr. Fabian Rue Byron. You're welcome to Informa Speaks. Thank you very much. Good morning, Informa. Good morning. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you. Yes. Who is Dr. Adeshino Ayodele Fabian Rue? Byron. Well, um, Dr. Adishino Ayodele Fagbenro Byron, which is, uh, uh, people call me Shino for short, or SFB. Well, uh, I was born in Ibadan, but from a Lagosian father. My mother's from Ekiti State. Uh, I was born in 1959. It makes me 59 years old. Studied most of my uh, early education in Ibadan, Berry Hill Convent School, Government College Ibadan, then later Federal Government College Lorry. And then I went to University of Ife for about two years, then University of Ibadan. Uh, I studied economics, first degree, law, second degree, had a master's in information science. Uh, I've done a bit of teaching, uh, consulting, accounts and then of course I practiced law for a while thereafter I uh, worked in an oil company briefly and then I went into development work policy public policy and development work uh, most of my development experience was in international development and public policy and uh, I retired from the Department for International Development, the British government, DFID, as a governance advisor and regional head, of the Southwest Lagos, and for a while, regional head of the Southeast, Enugu. And since then, I uh, started my own consulting firm, which is uh, strategy and governance and public service delivery improvement consulting firm. Uh, I have a vision for Nigeria. I believe Nigeria is the best kept secret in the sense that we are blessed, highly blessed and highly favored. Well, I'm married, happily married to. My wife is Lola Day and we have uh, children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Why do you want to be the president of Nigeria? Well, you know, um, in the first place, um, there's going to be a vacancy in 2019. Um, Nigeria needs um, uh, not only leadership, but Nigeria needs, Nigeria is at a point where um, we are facing dire challenges. And we're in a dire situation. If you look at the trajectory at which uh, we're going, the value of human life, um, uh, issues around security, uh, issues around livelihoods, uh, you wonder what future portends. Um, and if you take a deep look at where quite a bit of the, um, the issues lie, you know, the weaknesses and what has led us to where we are, most people will tell you that a lot has to do with leadership. When you become president, yes, please. what would you immediately be tackling out of all of these problems and issues? You have to have a multi-pronged approach. There are so many things that you'll be doing. Something, even what you do in the short term, in the middle term, and the long term has to be started immediately. In the first place, immediately we should put things in place to restructure this country. Because an engine not fit for a purpose will not carry you anywhere. The second thing that we'll be doing, and I'm not putting this necessarily in sequence, right? The restructuring is more of a midterm thing because it has to be accelerated and it has to be configured. There are constitutional arrangements and there are administrative arrangements. The whole idea of restructuring is to make sure that power resides more in the hands of those who make up Nigeria. But having said that, on another plane, you immediately start a series of priorities. And the first priority is security and safety. That means reconfiguring the armed forces and the 
security infrastructure, which is not unrelated to decentralization and restructuring. Then you make sure that you focus as a second priority on that plane, on education and health. Because we've said the greatest resource any nation has is the people. And the people are only worth the level of education and the level of health they enjoy. Put an educated and healthy people in a space and you, you can explode. So, in that regard, you can follow up with innovation. Or even before that, you look at the environment. We have to deal with the environment. You have issues of gully erosion in the southeast. Massive. And which is, a number of people wonder why people from the southeast travel out. But it is not unconnected with the fact that the land, the physical land under the feet of those in the southeast is being eroded right under their feet on massive scales. You have desertification in the north. You have the drying up of the Lake Chad. When we were young, the Lake Chad used to provide tourism and livelihoods for upwards of 10 to 20 million people. The drying of the Lake Chad itself is a major problem. So you have to face that. You have to face the cleaning up of the Niger Delta. Because the livelihoods in terms of fishing and fish farming and all that has totally been disseminated. So then you go to innovation because we've said we are in the fourth industrial revolution. And it's about data. It's about innovation. The only way you can grow your GDP right now is by services and through innovation. Developing application, developing new ways of doing old things. And the third, the, the, the fourth thing has to do with the infrastructure and the economy. But you see, the reason why it's in sequence security, health and education, environment, innovation, and then last economy is because you need a safe environment to ensure that people are educated and healthy, to ensure and maintain your environment, which is your physical space. Then they can be creative around that, and that's when your economy and your infrastructure, even if you put infrastructure down, if they are not maintained, they have to be maintained by people who are educated, who are healthy, who understand how those infrastructure works. And I define Nigeria's national interest as the pro to protect and preserve Nigerian lives, Nigerian lands, and Nigerian livelihoods, as well as the social welfare, the welfare of any Nigerian wherever they may be, including that of our friends within. I'm just wondering, yes. if you were to hear the question, where is he coming from? What yes. has he ever done for Nigeria? Oh. What would your response be? The first thing I did for Nigeria is I served. I did my youth service corps. And I taught several students, one of which is a, high court judge, a federal high court judge today. But more robustly, as I went on, I was in the civil service. I was in the, sorry, um, uh, you know, uh, civil society. Um, I supported the democratic movements with the concerned professionals in the 1990s and um, did a couple of things. But in my professional life, when I started my consulting, one of the first things uh, I could claim credit for is being part of the two-man team that secured the first funding for the EFCC, 22 million euro. I was on that team. I was also on the team that uh, designed the um, BMPIU due process office. I was on the team that did the um, public procurement assessment for Nigeria and the public procurement assessment for Lagos State when Tinubu was in power. Uh, while I was in DFID, uh, first of all, I was uh, the national co-chairman for Savicom because DFID was funding Servicom, that is Service Compact with Nigerians, to improve public services. 
the co chairman was Adube Obe, which is the what was the special advisor to the president on service delivery. And because I was on the funding side and I was the lead advisor on service delivery improvement, right? I was the co chairman of the steering committee for Savicom. I was also the lead advisor to support to the National Assembly during the time of Pius Ayim, who are providing him technical assistance. You know, uh, I was also on the uh, security justice and growth. I was lead advisor for security justice and growth of the FID, supporting Nigeria to design what is called community policing. And a number of those who we trained then are now the deputy inspector general of police and whatnot. Some of them are retired. And then uh, I did things like that at the federal level up until 2009. Then when I got transferred, I came to Lagos. I came to head DFID in Lagos, Southwest. I provided technical support to every single Southwest state from Fashola to, I, you know, the man in Ugu State, Kai Defiami, who's been reinvented re there. I provided him, to, if you see when he was... Um, you know, in, in his interview he, to be a minister, he attributed so much to DFID. I was the head of DFID Southwest. I took in support to Ikiti. I provided support to other states too, or your states. Uh, we did a lot on violence against women. I conducted the first women in governance conferences, set of conferences, 2012, 2011, uh, 2012 2013. And uh, most of the first ladies, uh, I gave them platforms to speak and to air, and we actually aggregated the impact of women in governance. Uh, another thing I did was to establish the first state-level measurements of MDGs. And we had an MDG countdown from 2010, when I entered, became the head of uh, DFID Lagos, for all the southwest states, including Kwara. Right? So we measured MDGs on each of the states. You know, the MDGs was measured nationally. It was never disaggregated until I came in, and which is, I insisted we have to disaggregate and measure MDGs on a state-by-state -state basis. Because if you say MDGs for the entire Nigeria, you miss where the shoe pinches. You, diff you, you don't know what's the difference. You just say malaria is so, 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 and so in Nigeria. But that doesn't mean anything. Because you have to know what it is in Oyo, you have to know what it is in Ogo, you have to know what it is in Sokoto, you have to know what it is in Anambra. And incidentally, I told you that I was uh, the uh, also head of DFID in Enugu for about a year. So I did Obiano's initial, when Obiano was handing, uh, Peter Obi was handing over to Obiano, I conducted his first exco retreat induction for his key commissioners. He's alive today. I did the same thing for Guru in Enugu. I conducted his first retreat. In fact, that was my last assignment in Enugu before I left. And all those things we did in terms of looking at state-by-state -state indicators, monitoring and evaluation and stuff like that, that was most of my business. Right now, um, when I retired, the first assignment I, 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 I undertook was a contract uh, with the World Bank, consultancy with the World Bank, on what you call the Save One Million Lives program, improving maternal and child health. And I was assigned to provide technical assistance to eight of the states that did not have enough presence of development partners. Eight states, Oyo, Osho, Anambra, Imo, Abia, Edo, Delta, and Kogi states. My consultancy worked for them for two years, 2015 to 2017, improving maternal and childhood. We were working on six indicators to make sure that enough women, because the maternal and child indicators in, 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 in Nigeria is appalling. You know, children dying at birth, women dying at birth. So that was the technical, it was Mother Gold, Mother Gold Consulting. So we did that. So I would say I've contributed a bit and done a bit. So at every single level, from federal level, you know, uh, I think I've uh, uh, d done my bit. You have a leadership style of dignified inclusion. Would Absolutely, you want to talk that's about the word. It? Yes, dignified inclusion. Yes. Well, dignified inclusion actually has its origins in um, the establishment of the Yoruba dynasty by Odudua. 
Um, and it's a story. Odudua, if you know, Odudua was is Odudua was the progenitor of what you call the Yoruba style of traditional rulership, and the culture, and the Omoluabi ethos, and the Ifareko, right? And what he did was this: Odudua, he he came with administrative skills, administrative military and some technological skills. And that was how he was able to dominate and grow what you know today as the Yoruba culture. But he had opponents, several opponents called, there was Obatala, there was, you know, he had opponents. But what he did when he conquered was not to exclude them. He made them part of his government. Dignified inclusion is about ensuring that even those who are opposed to you not only have their say, they have their opportunities to demonstrate. Dignified inclusion is to make a man feel a part of you without begging, despite the fact that he may not have the advantage you have. If you look at the book, Why Nations Fail, why nations fail because they, they fail to be inclusive. The Yorubas will say, and I will translate it to you. They say, Omodegbo, Agbagbo, Lafidale, Efe. Toburi back with you. Tokuri back with you. Kedu Tiku. The first one says, is, A child, both the wisdom of the young and the wisdom of the old, is what created the great kingdom of Ife. That a child's hand may not reach the rooftop, but an elder's hand may not enter a small god. And usually in those days, a small god is where they put the key to safes. So you need the combination of the old, the young. The second one says that whether it's a woman who kills a snake or a man who kills a snake, the most important thing is for the snake to be killed. So this is inclusion. And this is the only way societies are built. So it's not a matter of whether you're young or old, you're young. Some people say not too young to run. They want to push that it's time for the young ones. I don't have issues with that. But it, not too young to run. Well, it depends on where you're running to. So you must have direction, even if you are running. And I believe many of our young folks have direction. Don't get me wrong. But age is overrated, whether young or old. Those people who have been in government in Nigeria for the past 25 years, everybody knows that most of them were in government before they were 25. From 1966, when they threw out all those old men and killed most of them, most of the guys involved, all that generation that fought the civil war and led us to the civil war, were under 30 years old. And the same complaint was, oh, these old people are there, they should go. Old people are there, they should go. But then they get there and go, huh? Oh. They too will get old in that space. So people should be a bit careful. In the US, for example, Barack Obama was under 40. His success was over 60, was over 70. So it's not a matter of age, it's a matter of ideas. It's a matter of ability, it's a matter of capability. It's a matter of who wants to be accountable to the people. Who wants to be responsive. So that's what dignified inclusion is. Include people with dignity. You don't include people as an afterthought. You don't include people with tokenism. You don't say, okay, she's a woman, let's make her women affairs. Who says a man cannot be minister of women affairs? Any man who has a wife who has daughters can be minister for women affairs. The whole idea is to get the job done. But when you fixate and you include people on the basis of just because you want to tokenify then that is not dignified inclusion. So my philosophy is dignified inclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have been watching and listening to Dr. Adeshino Ayodele Fabuero Byron, the presidential aspirant with so many names, SFB for short, Shino Fabuero Byron. Thank you very much for coming on Informa Speaks. Thank you so much for having me. Thank Excellent. you so much for your time. Hello, Eunice. You're welcome to Informa Speaks. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Glad to have you around. 
the outrage at your audacity <laughs> <laughs> when you declared your intention to contest for presidency oh my God. <laughs> come 2019 has um, blossomed into admiration for your tenacity and veracity. You have even become a reference point to some youths and some women, home and abroad. Tell me, how does that make you feel? Oh, I feel so blessed, so lucky, and I'm so, so happy that I stepped out. Like, honestly, I was scared. The fear was real. Like, I expected to be rude. I expected to be laughed at. I expected the worst because I know what I'm doing is very unusual and I thought I wasn't ready. But quite fortunately, the moment I made up my mind, okay, whatever happens, I'll deal with it But I'm getting out there. And then I did it. As soon as I did it, and then of course there was the outrage, go and marry and have children, what's your problem? And there was the, oh my God, oh my God. And then gradually the, oh my God, became more. And then people were calling in, how can we help? We would really like to pro promote you. This is amazing. And then I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Like, and now it's real. I am highly likely to be the president in Nigeria in 2019. Like every day I wake up and I'm like, this is coming true every day. I'm like, I'm just so grateful, Nigerians. Thank you very much. I mean, it's the early days I know, but honestly, I'm grateful for all the support. Could it be serendipity that yes. your name, Eunice, yes. means not just victory, happy victory, but good victory, happy victory? You have researched me. This is she, I'm she in conquers. Life. And interestingly, your surname, Atuejide, means she pursues and recovers all. Tell me, what if your name wow. or your names eventually authenticate your quest? If you emerge victorious, amen. Amen. I've never thought about this in relation with my name, but sincerely, I feel good. I mean, thank you for researching my names and for even telling me. I've never thought about this in relation with my name, but you're absolutely correct. I am the kind of person that if I pursue it, I get it. I just have to. I really, I do not do things halfway and with bots or no. I really go for it and 99% of the time, if I set my heart to it, I get it. So, I have set my heart to the presidency. I will get it. I know I will. So, I don't know if it's a serendipity. <laughs> 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 I don't know what it is, but I know I work hard. I really do work hard. I love working. I've always thought about things and then done them. I don't just think about them, dream them up and then let it be. I always look for ways to keep going and keep doing things, no matter where I am and no matter the circumstances I find myself at. So if I set my mind at something, I work towards it. No matter how difficult it looks, I just believe that so long as I keep putting the pieces together, it could take time, but it will happen. And I'm very friendly with time. I don't mind things taking time, provided they happen. So, my names. My names are two today. Interesting. Great. That means I'll be victorious. I will be the president of Nigeria. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Wow. I hope you haven't discovered too much. About <laughs> <laughs> this is scary. This is scary. So, tell us. Who is Eunice Atwejide and why do you want to be the president of Nigeria? Well, Eunice Atwejide is your everyday person. She is that girl who was born in the ghetto but said ghetto life is not for her. She's going to work her way out of the ghetto and she's not going to do it licking anybody's fingers. So, I'm that girl that you find on the street who doesn't have food to eat. You find her walking to school without shoes, wearing one uniform to school for four years or more, and then borrowing to attend debates and, you know, work hard to help her school progress or win competitions because she can't afford the uniforms, so the school has to borrow her their, you know, they have sample uniforms and you have to wear them to be able to represent your school. So I've always tried to be outstanding, no matter what the circumstances are. And I'm saying to myself, 
that unit, and that's the person we need in charge of our affairs in Nigeria. We need somebody who has seen the worst side of poverty in Nigeria and fought through it and come up at the other side where things are less difficult without ever, ever, ever giving in to the vices. Because you come across them every day, somebody is offering you a faster way forward, either sex or illegal work, um, drug pushing, drug trafficking, or uh, obtaining by false pretenses. People would always meet you and tell you, you don't need to go this long growth. There are shorter routes to go. And you have to make up your mind how you want to go. If you want to go with your dignity, Please stay on the right path and take a longer destination. But if you want to go fast, you may be lucky. You know, tomorrow you are Instagram um, vixen and you are blowing up and whatever. But most times it doesn't really last. Even if you seemingly look like everything is working for you, inside you'll be hurting. You would hate yourself. From inside you will look and you're not proud of yourself because you've compromised. So I have confidence that Difficult as the terrain is in Nigeria, disgraceful as things are with a lot of our politicians, dishonest as a lot of politicians in Nigeria are, and unpredictable as our people, the electorates are, I do believe that it's only about time that people like me show them who we are, where we have come from, how far we have gotten in life without compromise without compromise, and I give them that hope they need, that love they need, that opportunity to trust again. And then I believe when the people get to know me, they will know that they are safe with me. And once they know they are safe with me, it's only about time they will vote for me to be their president. I'm so confident. So Eunice, the everyday little girl, blossoming into a woman now and asking yes nigeria support me let me lead this country out of trouble because i can i have led many out of trouble and they didn't have to compromise at all i have never had to compromise i've been tempted but i never gave in and that's why i think i'm perfectly suited for this job interesting you know nigeria has, has a lot of problems Security, corruption, poverty, unemployment, you know them. What would you be tackling immediately and how? The first thing I would do as president is to select the best of Nigeria to come to office with me. Whether you're looking at the ministries or the ambassadors abroad or the directors of the parastatals or the service chiefs, or the ones in charge of, just name it. You need to put the best of Nigeria in charge of our institutions. Why? Because if you put the usual people, you'll get the usual results. Every allocation you get, they spend it all, they pocket the money, leave large, and then leave the work undone and leave the people suffering. But if you put committed, patriotic Nigerians who are willing to offer an accountable and transparent government to us Nigerians, then you begin to see the change you really need. Now, I'll give you an example. Before Buhari appointed his cabinet, there was a six-month gap. That was the best six months in civil service that I've ever experienced. In that period, you could come in with a job and you're done in three months. You don't have to bribe anybody. You would never have to sit to wait for any director. Before you get to the office, usually you come in there at 8 and then you are sitting down till 2 before you even get to me. So you come in there at 8, it's already waiting for you. By 8.15, you are done. And you're like, oh my God, is this happening in Nigeria? Well, yes, it was happening in Nigeria. Why? They were so afraid of the caliber of people I am for Nigerians, one for all, not for everybody. What was I? I was for, I'm for nobody, I'm for everybody. I can't remember that speech. But he made it and he scared everybody. And in those six months where he was speaking, his expert, amazing, and like, oh my God, cabinet, people were doing their jobs. People were too afraid of the consequences of doing things as usual. So they woke up. Everybody, cleaners, uh, ambassadors, like just name it, everybody was doing their work. As soon as the cabinet was named, oh my God, six months, you haven't even seen that director that you can see within 15 minutes and be done. Everything is signed, sealed, delivered. Six months, you are still coming every day. They are get 
you can't see anybody without driving. The secretaries have gone back to business as usual. Even the janitors won't let you pass until you pay them something before you cross to see the secretary. And the secretary will hand your file over like that, like that. It went back. It even went worse than it was before he won the presidency. And I just said to myself, oh my God, that's what Nigerians need. They need leaders. And I, sorry to use such words, but that they can be afraid of. They need people that would not take it. They would not accept any nonsense from you. So if they have a president who is not taking nonsense, and the president has ministers who, is not take, who are not taking nonsense, and the ministers have directors who are not taking nonsense, and the palm sex are not taking nonsense, oh my God. Our education, our hospitals, our schools, just name it. You will just see everything would start working because every allocation you make, you'll be able to follow it. The president has assigned you. Now it's your job as minister to make sure that every project that has been a mark for improvement or for start or for whatever it is, you are doing them. And then it is now your job to make sure that the contractors that you are giving all these jobs to are delivering and are delivering on time and are delivering at the highest possible quality. Things will start working. People will start obeying rules because now they know there are consequences. It's not about the air service. I service will pay to uh, police, jobs, uh, uh, um, banking uh, matters. Everybody would know you do not do the right thing. There are consequences. Why? Because I have put great Nigerians in charge of our affairs. People who are experts in their fields but who are uncompromised. People that don't have any interests other than the interests of Nigerians at heart. They are not owing anybody any explanation for anything. They don't care who you are. It's about what their jobs are and about delivering dividends for the people of Nigeria. That's my first act as president, making sure that the best of Nigeria gets this opportunity to sit in the places where they can perform at their utmost for the country. Thank you. Mm. What would your response be to, where is she coming from? What has she done for Nigeria? What have I done for Nigeria? I have been a great citizen. I have never been involved in crime. I have never done anything that most of these people that you are happy to vote for have done to you. A lot of the heartaches you have today, I was not part of the reason that cried. So that's the best thing I've done to you all as Nigerians have made sure I stayed away from everything that hurts all of us. So that's my best contribution to Nigeria, being a good citizen. And now I want to be a good citizen in the leadership so that people like me will be confident enough to step up. There are good Nigerians, but they are not the majority. People who have refused to compromise, they are not the majority because just imagine it. You are a teacher in a school and your school receives a location for a laboratory and then the money is shared among certain people in the school and opportunity comes for you to follow and share you refuse the first one you refuse the second one by the time the third one comes ha ah, now only me you will take then the one that is in the ministry of health we have allocated funds for the development or improvement of the hospital where you are the head and then the funds have come and the one that is ahead of you says no uh, even if it's 20 billion that was allocated, let us use 2 billion, let's take 18 billion. Ah, you're a good person. You can't report them because if you report them, you risk losing your job. So you have to ignore, you look away, they take the 18 billion, they share. They're all building big houses in the choicest parts of Nigeria, and you are still there coming from your face me and face you. But it's only a matter of time you will join them because they tell you either you beat them or you join them. Most of us end up joining them. There are only a few who refuse to join them, who may even resign because they can't take it, they can't be part of that much evil. So they rather go and be teachers, or they'll go and be driving Uber, or they go and be farming and selling their you know, food crops and stuff. Those Nigerians with all those great qualifications, but who can't take it, and as a result are outside the system, they'll be in the front lines when I'm president. Because you know, the fact that they can't be Part of the evil means that no matter what anybody is offering them, they are going to always do the right things. And there are, so, there are, I know there are such Nigerians. I'm one of them. 
So I'm going to look for those people and bring them to the front. I've already started actually. National Interest Party, that's what we've been doing. We've been screening people, making sure that we are finding good Nigerians wherever in the world they are. A lot of them are here, some of them are abroad. Our job has been for the past two years to be locating them, talking with them, promising them that we're going to be in the front lines. And when we get there, we're coming for them because they won't have to be afraid to do the right things for this country. Thank you. What significant contributions would you make to Nigeria when you become president? Oh, I love you. I love you. When I become president, the first significant thing I would do is to open things up so that there's less secrecy. You know, there's so much secrecy in the way they do things, so that's why it's easy for them to steal. Allow for transparency, allow for accountability, insist that every penny that comes out of government to anywhere, there is, you can follow it. You can follow it, okay, there is 20 million going to that company to build that road. Everybody see it, that's the website where it is. Check the company, check everybody that's involved in that company, follow the money. So Nigerians can actually follow their money. Find a lot of Nigerians on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Give them the opportunity to use that fun thing they do to make sure that their money is working for them. So I will open up the government, allow everyday Nigerians to see where money is coming from, where it's going to, who is handling, and why they are handling. And then when you think that things are bloated, like, ah, how can they pay 20 million to just build ordinary two kilometer road? Raise alarm. Raise alarm so that those of us at the top who can't really see what's happening at the bottom, we can now see it and then we can investigate it and then make sure that even in the police force, whether it is the enforcement part or the judiciary, everybody is on hand to make sure that Nigerians get the benefits of democracy. Make sure that the people are doing what they should be doing at the right time. That's the most important thing in Nigerian is and that's the first thing I'm going to give to Nigeria. Accountability transparency make sure that everybody in government every public fund can be followed and can be followed for the by the everyday nigerian i mean you go to the u.s you see their website you can literally follow everything uk germany you see the way they do things i mean it's not like national uh, security matters this is just economy you can see how much they are allocating to everything you can follow the money but in nigeria 20 billion, 20 trillion, and then it doesn't make sense. You hear the budget and you're like, how does it work? Like, how does it come together? It doesn't really come together. Then they tell you they spent 1 billion doing Boko Haram that they have conquered. How? You know, like, too much, too much secrecy in our government, in our spending, in our economy. Where the money is coming from, we don't know. Where it's going to, we don't know. How it's coming, we don't know. How it's going, we don't know. We need to open all that up. That's the first thing I'm going to contribute to Nigeria, and I believe nobody will take it back. Once it's done, it's done. You can't come back and say, okay, let's go back to secrecy. No. Once you go in there and you're bold enough to just open it up, everybody know exactly what is coming in and what's going out. Nobody can come back and change it again. I like so That's the first thing I'll give to Nigeria as a president. Transparency, accountability at all levels. Compulsory. Thank you, Eunice. Do you have anything else to say to Nigerians? <sighs> Nigeria, sick on me. Stop taking money. All these 4,000, 5,000 to vote. But it's hot to know. You are the one suffering it most. So what happened in Ekiti? Whether it's true or not, at least we saw it on TV. People were paying 4,000 naira, and though they paid 4,000 naira went and voted, whether it was who they really wanted to vote or not, we don't even know anymore. But it's unnecessary. You that you are paying, you that you are collecting, you are like, a disgrace to Nigerians. And then you people that are actually voting because somebody paid higher than the other, you don't deserve to be in this country. But I'm begging you, we we'll forgive you, but don't do it again. Presidential, ha! Play two dead people. Army did not go there, police did not go there. We didn't see any of these people that came to you people in ATT to protect you so that you vote for a particular person. We didn't see them when these people were dying, but you collected 4,000, and then what it will give us is more deaths. One was not working, so my prayer, my belief, I don't know, I'm begging. Please, let's think about it. Look at the quality of candidates that are asking for your votes. Vote good people, because Nigeria is going nowhere if good people don't take the lead. Thank you, Thank you Eunice. Wow. <laughs> you have been watching and listening to 39 year old, young, but daring. Eunice Atwejide, a presidential aspirant. Who knows 
her names might as well authenticate her quest. Eunice, thank you for coming on Informa Speaks. Thank you so much. Well, well, well. Today's presidential aspirants are dogged, resilient, and tenacious. They are also extremely unassuming. If you do not listen to their articulate reasoning and exploits, you will not even know how accomplished they are. Thank you, Eunice, for helping to balance the gender issue. Thank you, Adamu, for great insights. Thank you, SSB, for the lesson on dignified inclusion. Thank you, viewers, for keeping faith with me. Follow me on all social media platforms, Ifama Chibogo and Ifama Speaks. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and also subscribe to my newsletter and articles on my blog, ifamachibogu.com. Thank you. Thank you so much. And remember, life is meaningless until you find your purpose. Till next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>